Throughout our lives, sometimes we put things into little buckets, where we say, this goes here and that goes there, and all is well with the world. Now, this is not a bad thing. It's actually quite natural that us humans do it. We enjoy establishing systems of how we observe the environment around us. However, if this trait is taken too far, if we take it too seriously, it can actually be quite dangerous. I have done this myself, actually. I'm actually quite guilty of it, because I did this with school subjects. I grew up believing that I loved music and I loved math as two completely separate entities, until I learned about their connection. Now, I have this little joke with myself that my love for math came piece by piece in the mail, because it was more of an evolution than an aha moment. See, what happened was, in elementary school, Yes, I'm going that far. I was put in the more advanced group where we learned math. Now, I didn't think much of it. Now, who would? This is elementary school. It's not like anyone goes around bragging what group they were in in elementary school. But looking back, I wish I had recognized that I had a knack for mathematics. Maybe I would know maybe more today. Because as I got older and my classes got harder, I realized, yes, I still struggled, but I loved math. Oh my goodness, the challenge of a math class is one of my favorites, even if I did not get the answer right. And because of the all-powerful accessibility of the internet today, I have extended my studies to something more casual outside of class. I am subscribed to some math YouTube channels, and it is quite fun. All in all, I consider myself a passionate lover of math who casually studies it. However, in the other bucket, my love for music was developed quite differently. You see, my first formal exposure to music was in middle school when I took an introductory choir class. Actually, that's a lie. Most of us had to flirt with the cute sopranos. Actually, my first formal exposure was in freshman year of high school. What happened was I was exposed to a new magic word, solfege. Now, most of you guys, I'm pretty sure, are aware of solfege. You've pretty sure have all heard the syllables from the sound of music song that goes, you know, a deer, a female deer, and then you know you know you guys know the rest. What it is, it is a system that aids singers in learning a piece, where you assign a scale degree, a solfege syllable, and it helps them find the note as they are learning it. And I was intrigued by this newfound system. I wanted to know more. So my sophomore year of high school, I took AP Music Theory. Now, for those of you who aren't students, AP stands for Advanced Placement, which means the class is a bit harder, there's some college level stuff, but at the end of the year, this is the special thing, there is a test to see if you can get college credit. A one to two is failing, three is just passing, four is exceeding, and five is, oh, you're a master. And that class was mind blowing. I started learning that there was more than just major and minor scales, that there was these things called modes, such as Lydian or Mixolydian or Dorian, and that composers would pick them depending on the feel that they wanted to convey in their piece. I started to learn what a chord was and new ways of looking at them. For example, I learned Roman numeral analysis, where instead of looking at one chord progression, such as C, F, A minor, G, you can look at just what the chord is doing, what its job is in the song, where you have major one is where home is, major four gently, gently pushes you out the door, minor six makes you miss what you have left, and then major five turns you back to, you guessed it, home. And I can literally stand here and regurgitate for hours of all the amazing things I've learned in AP Music Theory, but I'm not going to. <laughs> At the end of the year, the date of the AP test rolls around, and I walk in as confident as ever with my newfound passion that I thought was going to get me a good grade on this test. A couple months later, I get my score back, and I got a one. Not a two, that's failing with dignity. No, I got a one. And I, now, it's not the end of the world, obviously, right? You know, worse things have happened to people than getting one on an AP test. But at the time, it was devastating to me. Because this bucket that I thought I knew and loved, it turns out, I just loved. So, life goes on, and next year my schedule got too big, so I couldn't take any music classes. So my favorite class was my math class, which was calculus and I was a regular student, no music. And hindsight is 2020. I thought my music journey ended right then, but then it was just the beginning. You see, I was struggling, you know, I'm not you know, amazing at math, and I was struggling with derivatives. 
Now, I'm going to give you a little one second calculus lesson here. In calculus, when you have a function, its derivative is how fast the function is changing, the slope. And we were learning the derivatives of trigonometric functions. And for those of you with quick eye, you would realize that there is a pattern. It goes sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, and then it repeats itself. But for the weirdest reason, I was struggling. I was not getting it. I, I told myself, Bryce, you need to do this. You have a test coming up. All you know it, it, is that it repeats like an octave. And then I caught myself. And I remember at the time, I actually turned my head to the side, and I realized that this image looked very similar to a piano keyboard. Just instead of pitches, there was derivatives. And I was intrigued, because later I made the same connection with the powers of I, where again, it goes I, I mean, one I, negative one, negative I, and then it repeats itself, just like an octave. And this set me on the right track, because at the end of actually that year, our calculus teacher said, OK, you guys have a research project, and you can choose anything you want. The only stipulation is that it has to include math. And I said, well, why not study music? And I was launched into a completely new world of music and math colliding into one bucket. For example, I learned that there was many mathematical ideas in music. For example, most of you guys have heard of the idea of symmetry, a very mathematical concept. In kindergarten, you probably learned if you take a piece of paper and if you fold it and it looks the same on both sides, it is symmetrical. If it is not, it is asymmetrical. Well, there are symmetries in music. In Bella Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celestia, the third and fourth violin do exactly that. The third violin moves five half steps down and then another half step. And then the fourth violin mirrors that by going five half steps up and then another one centered around the pitch of B. It creates a symmetry, which was crazy. I was going, whoa, whoa, oh my goodness. This is exactly what I was discovering. Just other people discovered it, discovered it before me. And I thought this was awesome because it turned out there was more than just Bella Bartok. There was other famous names, such as John Cage, Igor Stravinsky, and uh, uh, Schoenberg have all utilized math in their music. In fact, some of them adhere to the idea called serialism, where you abandoned the idea of setting a key or a mode to a song, and you instead pick a tone row. There are 12 pitches on a, pia a piano keyboard before it repeats. You have C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and it goes all the way up to the next C. Well, a tone row is one of these pitches, and they're ordered all around, quite sometimes randomly, sometimes it's chosen, into a little melody. Here, I actually made one as, a, as an example. This is what a serialism, serialistic melody would maybe look like. I made it myself. The rhythm is not that very complex, but one of every of the 12 pitches is represented. To make a song, I don't have to do any more music. I can just do math. In fact, play math games, to be exact. You see, now I'm just going to manipulate it, because that is the idea of what serialism is. Some common examples of what these math games look like is multiplying the duration of each beat by two, or sometimes three, and make it twice as long. Or maybe one instrument will play the melody, and another um, will play it half as long. I can move the melody up and down one octave, or I can have one instrument play the melody, and another instrument play it backwards and create a symmetry. And in fact, I actually continued to make these math games into a little miniature score. And the only thing I composed was a mini melody. Everything else was just math. Now, all of this is a lot of information. Why is it important? Why is one senior in high school nerding out about music and math have anything to do with you guys? Well, what this is is I was a product of interdisciplinary learning meaning I was combining many buckets into a project or an, or an assignment. And I was learning something else that I may not have learned if I just studied one bucket at one time. For example, at my high school, in order to graduate, you have to complete what's called a senior project. Think of it like a dumbed-down senior thesis in college. And it has to be in one area. But before you can do the project in one area, you have to take some course requirements. For example, at Liberties, the music course requirements are as such. And I noticed that none of them require math classes, which I didn't think was wrong. I don't think they should. However, I see a missed opportunity. I believe that students should also be given the opportunity of interdisciplinary learning, learning or seeing the connections between subjects. And so if I was, hypothetically, the superintendent of HSD, I would add this asterisk. 
that students are encouraged to take a fourth year of math. Now, yes, this is not life changing at all. Liberty does not offer like a set theory class where they spoon feed you the connections between math and music. But it would give students the opportunity to see a connection. And maybe it may not be music and math. Maybe it could be two separate subjects. But I hope that my story reveals the benefits of interdisciplinary learning. It makes students question the world around them, the buckets, the things that they put into those buckets. Interdisciplinary learning is exposing what is between those buckets. It makes students ask the question, why not? Thank you. <laughs>